What's going on everybody? This is PH Darren. Today I'm going to be talking about night vision goggles, nods, NVSs, NVDs, EO, whatever you've heard it referred to before. I'm going to be talking about uh, night vision goggles that I use in my job specifically as a United States Navy air crewman. Helicopter crewman to be exact. <laughs> Uh, there are lots of different air crew rates or just uh, jobs within the air crew community, but helicopter guy specifically is all I've ever done. I've never been outside the helicopter community. Nope. And I've been in three different communities. So I have a pretty good knowledge of how the helicopter community works in the Navy. And specifically when it comes to night vision goggles, I want to talk about this because a lot of people are fascinated with just night vision and wonder why, is it good, is it bad? Um, you know, they want to be able to kick doors down and all those other crap with nods on their head, and that's fine. But, you know, I think there was a picture I posted one time of me with some goggles, and someone said, why do you need night vision goggles? And I thought it was absolutely hilarious, and it showed their ignorance. I probably use night vision goggles more than any special operator uh, group. What? Now, I'm not saying I have more time behind the goggles as certain individuals, but as a whole, I use night vision goggles primarily. Just if I'm flying at night, I've got night vision goggles on. Uh, if people have to work at night, or I understand you could work in the day and kick down doors, and you might have to go ahead and, and have your nods on for that training mission. But as a rule, when I'm flying anywhere from three to four hours straight at night, I am actually on goggles. And not only that, if I'm not on goggles, it can very much impact our crew and that's not good. So um, it's not just a training thing for me when we wear it. Although training is happening, it is still a life and death situation for me to wear night vision goggles. Um, so I definitely know about night vision goggles. So just kind of getting into the ones that I use specifically, I use the Anvis 9s. Um, this is the little designator for it right here. Uh, AN, AVS, TAC-9. And then in parentheses it says F4949R. The R stands for rotary wing. And that is what the enlisted aircrew first wore in like the 1980s, I believe, in like C-130s. Uh, so night vision goggles are not new. They actually first came out in like 1950s, like the late 50s. So just the, the overall system of using night vision goggles. And I remember I was watching a documentary years back and the most famous Marine sniper Carlos Hathcock, you know, the guy who shot through another sniper's scope that hole is right. and went through him and all that stuff. Um, he had the a Gen 1 sniper scope that was about a foot long. That thing was huge. And he had a Gen 1 sniper scope. I think it was called the Starlight. And the thing was huge because it needed a lot of voltage to operate it. So what all night vision goggles typically do is they obviously use batteries or something like that, some sort of voltage, and they gather as much light or photons as they can, and then they reflect it off the back of some freaking nerd level uh, intensifier, image intensifier, and then it reveals an image based on the amount of photons. So that's pretty much what it is in a nutshell. What? Uh, so those were Gen 1s, and Gen 1. Uh, MVDs or optics or night vision uh, lasted anywhere from about 10,000 plus hours or about around 10,000 hours of its like overall shelf life. And while I think that's pretty cool, uh, it degrades significantly when we get to Gen 2s. Um, and what Gen 2s have that are a little bit different is the fact that those were the first ones that could be mounted on flight helmets or ground helmets or anything like that, any helmet mounted type of a, a goggle. Uh, one of the other things about Gen 1 that Gen 2 also was bad for was blooming. And when we're flying around in my community, we say, hey, I'm getting bloomed out. That means I'm getting a lot of light from a source. And it doesn't have to be a heat source. It's not mainly a heat source. It's more of a legit light source, right? A, uh, a ship's light, um, uh, a lighthouse, something like that, a tower light. Those lights will be so bright that when the goggles actually see it, it's almost like a sensory overload for the goggles. And what they do is they take in so much light and shut down. And if they shut down while I'm in a very critical phase of flight, that's not good. Nope. So what we do is if we do see something and it's really bright, we instantly snap our head down or something like that, or sometimes we'll just cover the goggles up uh, with our face until we find out what that was. 
right? Uh, so like I said, Gen 1's huge, really, really large, over a foot long for that sniper scope. And then Gen 2's are the second gen, obviously, and they were the first ones to be helmet mounted. Now they had significantly uh, smaller lifespan. They lasted anywhere from about 4,000 hours of its uh, shelf life. Not shelf life, but you know what I'm saying, it's lifespan. And then you move in, and that's in the late 60s. So late 50s, Gen 1, late 60s, Gen 2. And then around the 1980s, like early 1980s, Gen 3 started coming out. And that's currently what we have today. If there's Gen 4s out there, I don't know what they are. They're probably the new white phosphorus stuff. Uh, but before me right now is I have some Gen 3s. And uh, I will talk about these and show you things about them that are a little bit different than uh, what you've probably heard or seen. So these Gen 3s came out, specifically these ones, um, came out in like the 90s, like 96 or something like that. Uh, but these are Gen 3s, so there's a little bit difference on like the, the way the cathode things. It has a different aluminum filming somewhere inside here that's supposed to aid in uh, low light performance. Um, they do last over 10,000 hours. So these last, as far as its overall operational lifespan, last longer than both Gen 1 and Gen 2. That is something significant that you would expect to see in a new generation. You want to expect to see something that could be helmet mounted and also have a very long uh, work life in it. So these specifically have a ball detent mount. Um, I do have another set of goggles at my house, but don't worry about that. We'll talk about that some other time. So what these ones right here do is they match the night energy. So because I do fly in naval aviation, um, that definitely helps out a lot. I will say the AMVIS and the AMVIS 9 means aviator night vision imaging system. So these are my night vision goggles. And before I kind of just like, you know, get into it. So you're going to see that right now I'm actually facing the goggles at you as if I was wearing them. This is what you would see. You wouldn't see this. This is where the goggles will be facing me and you would be looking through them. Um, they look fairly the same, uh, very much the same. But when you see it from this direction right here, you see that it's got these really big lugs on the front that you can use to actually like twist it. And of course you can twist the back too. And this is the diopter. And anybody who has scopes and people who wear glasses can understand a diopter is what's closest to your eye. And think of the objective is the one that's closest to the object. So as I'm wearing them like this, the object is actually out there and so is the objective. Uh, that's how I always remembered it. So that's just that. Um, so what comes in the box? It's obviously got this foam padding, which is trash. And uh, these are old. These goggles have been through hell and back thousand times over had to be so I'm gonna go ahead and just set these down right here uh, right here is the MVG mount that goes on my white helmet I have a HGU 84 I do not wear it often I don't wear it that much and so this goes on that helmet mount and it does have little like uh, whatever these are called these little sensors on the front and stuff like that and that does help with the, the actual connection so you put that on to your helmet via this, clip it on and leave it. And then of course the ball detent mount, as I was stating earlier for the objective lens would be facing out, would actually kind of just sit in there like this. And that's how it goes. So when it's actually locked up onto the helmet, it's like that. You push this thing on the side and you lock it down in place. So, uh, yeah. Moving on. Goggles and mounts. You obviously have your goggle covers. These are absolutely trash, but they do work. Um, these MVGs have been, at least from a military standpoint, cost about anywhere from ten to sixteen thousand dollars. Now I've seen an, a uh, an online ad for some Anvis nines going for about. 4,500 to 5,000 or something like that for those who want to purchase it go for it um, This right here is the battery pack um, On the bottom of it. It's freaking etched like a grip at times, but don't worry about the etching um, It's got weight to it now This is supposed to be weighted because it's supposed to help counteract because this will sit on the back of my helmet 
right, as a counterweight, if you will. And then this part right here, which is frayed and completely jacked up, mm. not good. Nope. You can definitely see the fraying on this. Not good at all. Yeah, I'm gonna have to write this up when I go into work and let them know. Like, hey, these goggles are uh, no bueno, dog. So, either way, you hook this up to an adapter that's on the back of our helmets. And then that, after having this connection right here, so this connection is a cord going all the way in the back of our helmets, going towards another one of these. And then, inside each side, you have, or each one of these two compartments, you have three volts of battery each. So you have a two pack of uh, AA, and another two pack of AA. One AA battery is one and a half volts, so two of them are three. You put them both face down, and then hear a positive snap. And then there's a little toggle switch where you just click it left or right. That's in the center, and that's to the right. So, uh, yeah. That's that. I'm gonna set that to the side. Um, and that should be it in here as far as all this other stuff until we get to this last portion Which is what a lot of us actually do use quite a bit So most crewmen will use this now what this does is it enables us to still use the night vision goggles and not have them mounted to our helmet directly So be, being that the objective is still towards the object um, There's no real good way to explain this other than it just feels more ergonomic to kind of hold it in your hand like this and you put it on the same way. So these are off, but then when I flip them back, they're on. And you can probably see the green lights. So when I flip these down, they're off. And then when I flip them back on, the green light comes on. And then you can tell that the actual goggles are on. Now, why we use this over just mounting them to our helmet, there are a number of reasons. You could be doing a specific gun shoot, you could be doing some search and rescue training. You could be doing um, just whatever in the back. You, you fill in the blank, you use it. And we'll put this lanyard like this over our helmet. And I'll literally just be having the goggles around my neck. Now, they're not always on. Some people will leave them on, on flight, and they'll just leave them like this where you can see that they're on. Like I said before, they're off, they're on. And they'll just leave them on. And if they need to actually look out the window or look in the cabin for something, we'll just like binoculars, just pick them up and we'll look and see what we have to see. And then we'll take it back down and do whatever we need to with our hands. Um, I don't know who else really does that the same way we do. And of course, once again, everything's different in specific communities. So what special warfare guys do on the ground are not gonna be the same thing that uh, we do in the air. Clearly, I am in a pissed off helicopter um, that's trying to shake your teeth loose. Therefore, the goggles aren't gonna be utilized in the same manner. So, a lot of people will still say, once again, why do you think you need to use goggles, right? Are you trying to be cool? Are you trying to whatever? And like I stated at the beginning of the video, I have more time on these than probably a lot of the ground guys, right? They have it for that mission. And then they train for that mission, just like I train for missions. But here's a thing a lot of people don't consider is sometimes our missions cross paths. So a lot of the ground guys will go and kick doors down and uh, take out a bad guy, whatever, in the process. But how did they get there? They didn't always drive Humvees. Sometimes they get there by helicopter. And I've inserted troops to buildings, to ships, to gas oil platforms, to just small areas in the freaking forest. And I have to fast rope them down, repel them, whatever it may be. And we're all on night vision goggles. So everyone in the back, every operator in the back, I've worked with SEALs, MARSOC, Rangers. Uh, I've worked with people from the French, whatever, whatever their freaking uh, stuff is. 
I've worked with some Saudi spec war guys, which that was kind of hilarious. Um, all of our EOD for the, our US military, um, SWIC, I've worked with a lot of people and and even some civilians too. We crossed paths with certain uh, police forces and border patrol, the border patrol tactical unit, uh, MSRT for the Coast Guard. I've done a lot of different stuff and there are times we're all on nods and that's another term I wanted to talk about too is nods because people will say nods, people will say goggles, people will say MVGs and that term gets like it's a broad term. So what I mean by MVGs is night vision goggles. These right here are night vision goggles. Um, they are also nods, night optic device. So it is a optical device I'm utilized to see at night. It does not turn day into night, but it aids in my situational awareness at night. The other thing you'll be heard, heard or referred to are NVDs, night vision device. That can be a night vision goggle, that can be a forward looking infrared, a low light TV device, anything that aids uh, in that is considered a night vision device. And then you have NVS, which is a night vision sensor. It is still a sensor. So that word interchangeably, I'll probably say it throughout the, this video. I might use them as nods. I might call them goggles. I might call them NVDs or MVGs. I mean the same thing. But as I stated at the beginning of that part, different people call it different things. And a lot of the ground guys I've worked with just refer to them as nods. Um, Jocko Willink, did a video of him reacting to a lot of Navy SEAL movies, which is fine. I think Active Valor was one of them that he stated. So the things on their helmet, this guy's got an actual light. I don't know why he's got it pointing backwards, but he's got a normal camping headlight. And then the other thing that they've got is a night vision mount, but there's no night vision on their gear right now. Or whatever, like some of the guys, as you can see right here, like my helmet on my uh, Team Windy Xfil bump helmet, it has the MVD mount on it right now. I do leave it like that. Now, if I'm going to do a dedicated daytime mission where I know I'm gonna be moving around the cabin a lot, I will probably just take it off. But if I'm doing just, I'm gonna sit on my freaking can and go from A to B in an hour, I'll probably just leave it on. It's not in my way. It doesn't add any extra weight to it. I don't wanna keep taking it on and off because then that's where fitment starts to happen. It gets loose. Um, and I don't feel like always taking this uh, MVD like adapter, like my cord, in and out of my helmet cover. It's easier to just leave it on there. But yes, I will take it out. I will put a GoPro mount, uh, night vision goggle setting like for the GoPro stuff. I'll do that if I'm doing specific flights. Uh, but by and large, I just leave it on there. It's already set up to how I want it. It's nothing that I have to turn into people. And the same ball of detent mount on this will fit with these goggles and I'll explain that later. Um, but yeah, so like I said, my paths cross a lot with other guys from other forces or other communities. So once again, for me, Navy Air Rescue, um, we are in the Navy Special Operations side, not Special Warfare. Have to say that people get that crap confused as they'll call Spec Ops, Spec Ops, Spec Ops, but then Spec War or SOF, Special Operations Forces. Um, th that's also another play on words that you can get into. Um, but yeah, so like I said, I've hovered over some pretty sketchy stuff before, and I have to make sure that aircraft is steady, right? Very, very steady. I do not want to have that Hearst Master, which is like a, the pretty much the guy who's on the ropes, helicopter rope suspension team. Um, he's the one who's saying, go down, right, the rope. So he's telling all his troops to get out of the aircraft. I'm the one who's making sure that aircraft is steady. We're not hitting trees, we're not hitting anything. Uh, we have the right distance. I'm actually calling out the guys going down. First man's out, second man's out, third man's out, last man's out, last man's on deck. Pulling the rope, rope's clear, clear to go. All that stuff. That whole time I'm doing that, I'm probably still mounting on an M240. Or, or some sort of a crew serve weapon in the back. And I have to have a lot of situational awareness, not only for threat target engagements that I have to scan for, I'm also looking in the cabin, making sure my troops aren't getting caught up on my gear, they're not leaving gear out. I've actually had to throw somebody's stuff out the cabin before. Um, 
they got on deck and they left a bag or they dropped some sort of pouch when they came out they hit the bottom of the deck and it fell inside the cabin and he just so happened to be the last man and i had to pull a cord so i had to get off my gunner's belt or get off of my gun grab that throw it out and the rope and then depart that hover uh for that so yeah i'm on goggles quite a bit and we use them for a lot more than just special warfare special operations missions we use them for basic unit level training missions all the time um, night familiarization we call them just night fams that is a a to b to c to, to b to a whatever you want to call it type of mission where we're just flying around there's nothing tactical involved whatsoever it could just be basic aviation at night and so navigation which is why pretty much even aviation even took on any night optic or night aided devices were to to aviate to navigate i'm sorry to navigate so if i can see where i'm at and get good references that's a plus right my my situational awareness increases quite a bit if i can know where i'm at based on things i see rivers uh lakes man-made statues uh lots of things but night vision goggles while they're great can also be very very tricky um, other missions i do is inclement weather if it's raining outside or something like that excuse me i can see that before i'm actually flying into the weather um, on goggles it looks like you see like obviously we're not in a hover so we're flying and you see these things that are going across your image intensifier the tubes when i'm looking at these and it looks like just white spots that are going through the side and we can and then i'll stick my hand out the window and feel that it's wet and i'm like yep we're in rain but you can see it prior to um other things while we're flying around with these goggles dang did i break something um being that i'm in the navy right a lot of people forget the navy has ships and we also have helicopters and those things sometimes cross so myself i have taken off and landed on plenty of ships some of them for training and some of them actual i've had to do medical evacuations to ships from ships on goggles off goggles and at night i've, I've had to do unaided we call unaided flights where you don't have goggles we are actually allowed to still fly unaided and land on a ship at night that's not fun i'll promise you that sometimes it's actually easier to do an unaided based on a lot of things right it could be the sea state is calm the ship is steady the moonlight is very perfect everything's ideal you can actually see the ship a little bit better than putting on goggles it'll actually be too much it may be for you the operator a sensory overload and you're like this is actually worse um, than having them so night vision goggles doesn't solve all your problems sometimes they can become a problem search and rescue the main portion of what people think my job is we do not only do rescues maritime, so once again, searching for people at night, flying around at night on night vision goggles. I am not going to see somebody stick out like a sore thumb in the water. It is not a thermal device. And even at that point, one person bobbing in the ocean, you are now the same temperature as that ocean for the most part. Your core temperature is going to start dropping significantly. And if the water's already warm, I'm not gonna pick you up either on thermals. That's just, I mean, yes, you can see people, but it's not as easy as movies make it out to be. They use specific devices to do that, or they'll heat up the whatever, the actor or the dummy, to make it look like they stick out like a sore thumb, and that's not reality. Uh, but we also do search and rescue over land, and that's a real thing. Not everybody gets shot down or falls off the ship. Sometimes people get hurt over land and we still do search and rescue over land. Once again, landing in trees and really, really tight spots, really confined areas, which is what a cow landing is, confined area landing. That is with us pretty much flying our helicopter and landing straight down and there's probably trees surrounding us. It's nothing that we could have flown in and did a normal approach. We had to come into a hover, come straight down and the one thing you lose the most of when you are flying on night vision goggles is depth perception. You have a little bit of it based on shadows and stuff like that, all your other sensors that your body uh, is using, but you can't see depth. You don't really have that like, that's that far. I, I don't know that, right? Your eyes can naturally pick that up. But when we're looking in these things right here like this, I'm looking at a TV screen essentially of what it sees. It's not what I'm seeing. I'm seeing what it sees. And if it doesn't pick up depth, neither do I. 
Um, the biggest thing, like I was saying about search and rescue, maritime or overland, is illumination. The primary source of illumination that we use for these goggles is the moon itself. We can turn on IR searchlights, infrared searchlights, and lasers and illuminators that we have, and that's cool, but the moon is our primary reflective source. The moon operates, or not operates, the moon reflects about 7% of the sun's energy. So anytime you see the moon, you see the moon because the sun is lighting it up. No matter if it's daytime or nighttime, that's why you even see the moon. But then it only reflects about 7% of that light back on Earth. And that's what we use primarily to pick up the MVGs um, to have them start to work. The other thing why I use night vision goggles a lot is for target engagement, threat avoidance. <laughs> Once again, flying around in uh, you know, hostile or enemy territory, we need, we need to verify that we're not flying directly in a WES or a weapon engagement zone. I do not want to be flying into uh, the proximity to be shot down by a surface air missile or anti-aircraft artillery, anything like that, ground troops, all this other stuff. So that's another thing. Once again, I built my essay. If that's the case, I'm definitely having these things mounted directly on my goggles. I will not have the lanyard around my neck and thinking like, oh man, I wonder if there's some troops down there. Nope. They're mounted and I'm looking. And I, I would say when I'm flying at night, 80% of the time, I do have them mounted directly on my helmet. Um, one of the, and then two, because it's a night vision devices, we can pick up uh, lasers, IR lasers and stuff like that, anything that's infrared that you can't see with the naked eye, I can see on goggles. And so the pilots will do that. They will match uh, lasers. We just call it sparkle. We will actually match that on targets if we have to. So I will put my laser from my weapon on it. They will put the laser from the uh, our imaging sensor from the aircraft on it. And we will get the same target and say, hey, do you see this target over here at the two o'clock? And I call out the wrong target. And if they put laser energy on it and say, no, this target, I'm on goggles. I can see that target. I'll put my laser on it. And then they say, yep, that's it. And then I can go ahead and engage that threat. Um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff to it. Um, as a matter of fact, I even have before me right now a uh, a D-ball, right? And a lot of people are wondering, like, what's a D-ball? It's a dual beam aiming laser. And that thing works a lot. I was flying on goggles doing night search and rescue, and I was doing a specific pattern with one of the guys on the ground and uh, told him where I needed him to be at. And I orbited a small little area with my uh, D-ball and he got there and then we came in and did a pickup. That was a tactical type mission. That was not a normal uh, just land scenario. So yeah, so these are the goggles I actually use when I fly with. Uh, so now I'll kind of just mount it to my helmet and kind of show you what that looks like and then you can kind of see, see that aspect of it. All right, so this is my helmet. This is what it looks like right now. There's quite a bit of crap on here. I'm not gonna do everything I would naturally do because if you see all this lanyard, this is a snag hazard. This is something that can easily get snagged in the aircraft. And on the helmet itself, there's this channel where I can go ahead and fit it kind of like it is up here and, and, and tie all this stuff down and all that. I'm not gonna do it for the purpose of this video, but just know that's what I would actually be doing if I was doing a real flight. So I never put these on, even though I can, I never put them on like this. Um, I'll just go, go ahead and show you, but I just kind of wanted to give you a, a look, a little 360 look of what they look like on a helmet. And then now I will show you what I would normally do to put them on. So taking these off and I do grab my helmet mount or my uh, MVD mount a lot as like a little bit of a uh, starter and I will put my helmet on. Once I get it all settled in, got my chin strap. I don't always have my chin strap. This cord that's dangling now is normally where this MVG pack is currently. And as you can see, I have those two shock cords that are going around it and that's keeping it very secure. Not going anywhere. 
So I'm gonna go ahead and snap and adjust my actual helmet to my head. I would have this hooked up to my like wireless ICS or something like that. I think I do have one here. I do. So this right here is how I can talk to the aircraft. I can hook this directly up to it and clip in. And this is a normal Pelotor jack, a U-174. I do have an adapter to hook up to my helicopter, which is why I clearly use it. So now that I have all this stuff on, I'm probably gonna leave my ears open instead of click down like this, or I'll just leave it down. I can hear myself. I don't need to hear myself outside of, of this. So what I'll do is I'll take these lanyards and you make sure the lanyards are just as like straight and I will just mount the goggles and I'll flip them up, right? So they'll flip up. I'll take this lanyard and put it around my head. Now I'm getting snagged on all kinds of crap, but I normally would have already done this. So there we go. So I'm going to snag this in case anything happens in flight and these goggles were to get knocked off my head, they would still be caught by the lanyard and just fall over my neck. Very expensive to lose. And there's a lot of paperwork. You look like an idiot. And yeah, you just don't want to talk about that. So now that my goggles are on my helmet, this is actually not comfortable. It's not uncomfortable. At least it isn't right now. I'm sitting in a room at my own posture. I'm not wearing a whole bunch of kit and I'm not shaking violently from a helicopter. Now it's not as bad as I'm making it out to be, but I'm not doing that. Where I, There's a typical bob in the helicopter that kind of equates to something like this. And when you do that for three to four hours, it'll wear your neck out. And that's probably one of the biggest downsides I've had to wear night vision goggles. That's also why this one has an extra weight in the back so it can help counteract some of that weight you feel in the front. It's kind of helping pull your head back. So I'm gonna push this to the side right here and flip it down in my face. It should already just be evened with my mount. And then I'll go ahead and turn that on. So I see that they're on right now. Um, I'm gonna use two fingers right here to kind of give myself what we call an eye relief. And that knob is right here. So that's gonna be my uh, fore aft adjustment. Then there's two knobs on the side right here. IPD, inner pupillary distance. Um, that's where you can kind of not everybody has the same eye. Sometimes their eyes are like closer together or spaced out. This adjusts that so you can see each monocular. So essentially, I'm not looking at one image, I'm looking at two images. So each of these are independent. They are just mounted together. So that's how I would set up my goggles, however I would look at it uh, during any other normal vision. I can still read and see my hands right here. So I can see my hands just fine. If I had to jot down some information about a target, a threat, uh, something we have to change, I can take out like a pen and a pad and start doing all of this right here and still be able to see a threat based on how my mount and my goggles are set up. Um, one of the other things about it that I wanted to talk about is just like how quick I can just flip them up like that. These do not protect you against laser energy. Nope or at least not the way they should. So if I was to be lazed while I had these on, the goggles themselves will be damaged and not my eyes if I was to look directly into it, but there's no real like way to uh, protect your face. So we do have to wear laser eye protection as well if we're going on like known laser flights. Um, I can fit my seeing glasses underneath as well if I have to, and I do have to wear my glasses while I'm flying and I can still use night vision goggles as well. So something like that. I will tell you this, you do not need to wear uh, your, your seeing glasses or if you have astigmatism, these diopters in the objective will adjust each monocular, each one of the tubes to your eye specifically. So do I need goggles? No. I'm sorry, not goggles, glasses, no. But if I'm landing in dusty, sandy environments, all that stuff will kick up and get in your face, get in your eye. 
so we want to wear some sort of like clear visor or if it's daytime i want to wear something like these right here these are my uh gaiters my delta m4s so i can still wear this now i can't see you at all right now and that's fine because they're polarized so like my screen is just completely black um so yeah this is what we would look like i would never be wearing this with goggles now i might wear it with the mbd mount itself um as i stated before like on a normal flight i probably will look like this i probably look dumb to some people um and i don't care right but either way i'm not going to take this off i will just take the glasses off and i will pop my ears back off Whew. wow um i will take the battery turn that thing off and do all that and do the clip So yeah, those are my MBGs. I will probably roll some footage in at some point, just kind of trying to show uh, what it looks like, or at least what I see when I'm flying. And hopefully that helps you out. Be aware that the footage you see looks a lot better with the human eye looking through the goggles than my camera. The camera is not as sensitive as the human eye. The human eye is probably, I don't even want to guess it's definitely much more sensitive. I don't know if it's hundreds of times, thousands of times, but it's a lot more sensitive to light than the camera. And uh, I was messing around with it before trying to get footage and I had to adjust the ISO and change the shutter speed and do all this crap. And I was like, dang, why doesn't it just see what I see? And I realized it's just a camera. So yeah, hopefully that answers some questions about the night vision goggles that I wear, why we wear it. We're not all the same. And uh, yeah. Also, I think I mentioned on another video, but I use this as well. I use this light from Streamlight, the stock. Um, it does have an IR mode. It does have a beacon part as well. So that will flash in infrared. I can see it also on goggles. So if I have some ground troops and they all have some sort of IR beacon and I see them on the ground, I can distinguish them from the enemies and I know who to shoot, who to protect. So. That's my video. Hopefully you guys liked it. Go ahead and subscribe for more. Give me suggestions of what stuff that you want to know about my community, if any. And yeah, I'll see you next time. Enjoy the footage. Peace. All right, everybody, this is the goggles themselves. Um, you see that they're starting to try and adjust in and out. If you can see the uh, black ring is going in and out. That is my camera trying to adjust themselves. Um, because of the autofocus. So it's probably not gonna do it as much. This is a light still on right now. And I will go ahead and shine a visible laser on the wall right by this lamp. I'm shining it right around the lamp. I can see it clearly, broad daylight. You can't see it on the actual footage as much. Now I'm gonna turn the light off. Okay, so right now they're actually doing the gain. So this visible laser that I can see, it's a red laser, I'm going to now put that on the wall. And so now I'm shining onto the lamp over here where this bright thing is over here. That's my Keurig or something that's super bright. Like I said, this is a lamp right here and then that's that. Now this is a visible laser, by the way. You can still see it on goggles and I can see it with my naked eye. I'm going to now turn on this. I'm using the D-ball, by the way. I'm going to turn it on the IR illuminator only. And you see how bright this is now? So this IR illuminator is all over the place, right? Now I can definitely change the spot or make it wider and things like that and just different things to manipulate it. But for the most part, I tend to not really mess with it as much. Um, yeah. So yeah, there's my IR illuminator and I will use that to pretty much like you can see right now, illuminate a room. Uh, I hit it on the ceiling where you can see the ceiling fan shadow and you can see how the ceiling fan shadow is dancing around as I do that. So this IR illuminator is essentially like a big old flashlight for me. And I will turn that off 
or go to the IR illuminator with the IR pointer. So that's both right now. And so probably a lot harder to see it. Let me go ahead and turn some stuff down. Nope, can't see it as much. You see the illuminator for the most part hitting this, uh, uh, whatever that thing's called, flashlight or the lamp. And then I'm gonna turn that off and go strictly to the IR pointer only. So here is the IR pointer. And now you can't really see it as much, but this is a laser that I'm shining in my room. And because it's so close, it all looks the same. And the sensitivity of this camera is a lot more. I think it actually looks better on my phone. So I might try that here in a second, just to find out. Okay, here is my helmet right now getting hit with the dual beam, the illuminator and the IR pointer right now. It looks pretty freaking cool if you ask me. Um, you can see all the vents right there, the cooling slots on top of the helmet and on the sides. You can see my MVG mount a little bit better. You can get a little bit more detail in it. Um, that actually looks pretty sick. Yeah, if I had to say so myself, you can see my Peltors and stuff like that, the chin strap, you can make out all that stuff on the MVGs. So yeah, there should be two, yeah, there's a pointer and a beam inside there. All right, so I'm walking up to these goggles right now and uh, well, I'm actually using the goggles. So there's my D-ball and here's my helmet with my MVG mount on it. You can see it, there's a flash from one of the uh, like fire detectors or something like that that keeps coming on. That's what that is. And just to help you guys out to give you a better visual reference, you can see that there's a lot of scintillation. It's those green dots everywhere that are just sprinkling all over the video footage. That is the goggles trying really hard to actually work on their own. So hopefully, um, this gives people an understanding of what actually goes on on the MVGs, right? They're working really, really hard to try and show me a picture of what it thinks I may want to see. And it clears up whenever that flash does come on. And uh, that flash obviously provides a lot of light, 